Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm a pediatrician and I actually work in a nursery. So when a baby is delivered and the OB hands off the baby to me, I'm sort of the quality control guy. I'm trying to decide, is this baby okay to go home or should they stay for a little bit and maybe spend some time in the NICU? And most of the babies are healthy, uh, but some of the babies will have inherited uh, some congenital disease or herit hereditary disease that will actually lead to a, a lifelong of chronic disease, which as a pediatrician is very important for us to manage uh, and coordinate uh, their care throughout their lifetime. Um, one of the other jobs of the pediatrician is to foster behavior change. So, for example, a lot of the habits are developed early on. Uh, your parents probably teach you that you need to brush your teeth, you need to eat healthy, but uh, sometimes that doesn't happen. And so uh, the job of a pediatrician is actually to make sure that during our visits with them or through another media that we, we encourage them towards healthy behavior. The goal actually is to maximize future health potential. So by the time we're done with them, we have to hand off to the internist. And then they could either you know, continue this care through the life course and continue to make the patient healthy. And if we do a poor job, then we're actually uh, not doing the internist a service and not doing the families and the patients a service. So one of the ways that we're beginning to think about how to optimize the health potential of individuals and populations is actually to use mobile technology. Uh, when I was in medical school, mobile technology means mobile vans, you know, that moves through the city. But here in Silicon Valley, I, I meant, you know, sensors and, and uh, iPhones and iPads and so forth. And I'm going to describe to you uh, the first example where uh, this, we did this seven years ago, uh, where we developed a mobile app. And at the time, I was very interested in a group of children with chronic disease. And these are the kids that are born very low birth weight, so less than, seven, uh, less than three pounds and four ounces, so very small. They're usually born prematurely, and they require multiple services in the hospital, in the NICU, and even after they're discharged home, they frequently require care coordination in, in, in many different specialties. And so uh, I was very interested in the quality of their follow-up care after they leave the hospital, because if they don't get the eye screens, they could turn blind. Uh, if they don't check their lungs, they could actually uh, have chronic lung disease that will lead to uh, a lifelong of maybe asthma and other conditions, and neurodevelopmentally, they are also at risk. So our goal is to actually help them to improve their outcomes over the lifetime so that they could learn, they could go to school, they could actually in the future have a job and be independent uh, kids. So I don't believe that it's just enough to save kids, but we have to give them a chance of succeeding in life. So in 2009, uh, computers has be had become smaller, small enough, uh, first the netbooks and then the iPads in 2009 to be small enough to put in a woman's purse. So uh, this is an incredible opportunity because then you could just push a button and the computer will turn on. And you know, for people that are born now, this probably is nothing, but you know, what, when you were waiting for the computer to turn on, that was a big deal. So uh, what happened is that I uh, took a loan from my department. And I said, you know, I'm gonna buy a whole bunch of iPads and I'm gonna buy the broadband service so I could give to the parents of children born very low birth weight and so that I could help them. So we developed a, a portal uh, that had daily check-ins. I just want to know how the kids are doing, you know, did they get the services they need, and give them appointment reminders, and we build educational materials for the parents. We call it the baby university, you know, it's like the infant CPR. When we try to discharge babies from the NICU, because we need the bed, we usually just kind of rush them out. But with this portal, they could watch the infant CPR anytime they want, per perhaps recorded by their nurse. Uh, and then we had uh, piloted some virtual visits. My baby's health is a record of their baby's health. And they could put some extras in there. But one of the important features, we, we put in a parent forum so that uh, parents uh, with uh, kids born prematurely in the same NICU could actually talk to each other as a form of emotional support and social support. So we want to know how that's going. And we had a checklist based on quality of healthcare indicators. 
So because these things uh, were all, I, I bought them the broadband and they were all put in my credit card. And so I, I, I need to know how much broadband to buy people, right? So I actually, I was able to log on my AT&T and try to figure out how much uh, uh, sort of uh, what's the plan I should buy them. And so sort of I got their weekly usage. And actually, uh, we also look at the density map of uh, when people were logging into to our portal. So as you could see that, uh, so actually during the day, you know, it's not so high, it's 92, but in the evenings, that's where the density is really high, that the parents are logging in, they want to know. And even in the David Letterman or the Jay Leno time, you know, the late night uh, periods, it's still pretty high. That means they're, they're not sleeping. They are awake when their babies are awake. And when they go home, they have become the human monitor for their babies. You know, in the NICU, there's a nurse, but when they go home, they're pretty nervous. And we also wanted to know if more people using the portal, there are more interactions between the family members, between the parents. So this is, we sort of got, got this uh, validation of uh, network externalities. You know, back in the days when we used to use facts, the more people have facts, the more likely you're gonna find it useful, right? This is the same thing. Uh, then we try to figure out who was interacting with who. Well, families that have never met each other find support from another family with premature infants, with, you know, sharing their same condition? And the answer is yes. Because we know when the par uh, parents were enrolled in the, you know, they got their iPad, and some of them would never have overlapped in the NICU because of the discharge time. So we were able to figure out who was talking to who, what the contents were. And then, so basically this became a place uh, for uh, families to get educational materials about their premature infants, a forum for families to share the same healthcare concerns and a platform for families to co-manage their children's health care. So the next story I'm going to tell you is about patient engagement. So well, we were very fortunate to get uh, uh, NIH uh, New Innovators uh, grant. Uh, thank you, Bill Wrighty, uh, for uh, supporting this kind of work. And we wanted to um, figure out, can we understand behavior change real time? OK, so we think about how do you how do you get people to engage in a platform? And we thought about, OK, people play video games, and they are pretty addicted to it. So we could take advantage of that. How many of you have United Air Airline miles? Uh, how many of you fly United because of your miles? Well, you're hooked, OK? <laughs> so basically, you, uh, you know, so, uh, so we want to use the same strategy uh, to hook people. And then at the time, there was also a book that came out called The Nudge by Thaler and Sunstein. And we thought, oh, maybe there are some behavior heuristics that we could use, like anchoring. You know? So you know, if you uh, set a higher target, uh, you are more likely to, to achieve a, a higher level. Uh, in, in, intention prompts. So if you have a specific plan on when to get a flu shot, like when and where and, and, you know, and how you're going to get there and what time you have an appointment, you're more likely to do that. And also loss aversion. So it turns out that uh, if I give you one dollar, and then I take it away, it feels like you lost two dollars. It's like two to one loss aversion, okay? So we want to use some of these heuristics in the design of our platform. So the hypothesis, this is actually a scientific experiment that I invite you all to join, okay? So we believe that specific combinations of hooks and nudges are better at sticking to individuals from different social democratic backgrounds for sustained behavior change. So, I'm a 45-year-old Asian male. There's no reason to believe that what motivates me is the same as a 16-year-old African-American female, right? So why should we have interventions that are the same? That doesn't make any sense to me. And so uh, we should be able to customize behavior interventions based on analytic models developed from large data, gather, and also use crowdsourcing principles. So when we try to develop a model like this, we try to figure out uh, should, should we go with the, 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 the difficult ones like obesity? And, and we voted against that because, you know, people eat with their friends and with their family. It's a cultural thing. So we went with the simple model, the flossing for dental caries. So not very many people floss with other people. It's usually pretty, pretty uh, you know, self-contained. So we want to build this model. So we created a tooth pad, and you could pick your pad, 
and you have, you know, you know your hygiene levels, and then the pet would, when the pet becomes increasingly dirty, and they will build plaque monsters on them, and you have to fight them off. Okay, so the the pets will grow up from little babies to be adults, and and then what happens is that they will go to school, and they will go to school. They will be exposed to the candy corporation, and the soda people who invite them to a bubble bath. Okay, and then you have to fight them off, and there are 50 quests. 50 storylines that they have to go through. The experiment will run for six months. And if, if, if the prior data uh, is correct, uh, it takes about four weeks to build a good habit. So you could download this Plaque Monster on your iPhone. Okay, please do that and enroll your children, please. We need the data, all right? So it's called the Plaque Monster. Uh, and then uh, so you could buy things, and some of the things will have superpowers to fight off the Plaque Monster, okay? And then, you know, you could build social connections, do teams. And if somebody doesn't floss in a team, it's a terrible thing. You know, uh, people are ashamed. And then, you know, it, you could end up in jail. You could be, get put up, put in jail by the plaque monster, and your friends could bail you out. Okay. So basically, let me tell you briefly about the experimental design. We basically, at different levels, we, we, have, we could randomize people at, at, when... It's a balanced randomization. So you're going to randomize people at level one, level two, level three. So a lot of people will enroll. And then once we get enough people, uh, for example, with the heads, so the green is the control and the red is the experimental. When we got enough heads, we'll begin to put people in different coats. And the, again, green is uh, uh, control and, and red is experimental. So what happened is that you, you have a factorial design using mobile health. So if we get 10,000 people enrolled enro in this app, we could probably run 10 experiments. So we could use this to run lots of different experiments using behavior constructs, heuristics, to understand at what point in time we need to help people uh, to foster a certain behavior. Uh, does the reminders work? better at this time or this other time. So then you could begin to map out the different hooks and nudges that motivate females and different social demog demographic groups. And you could be H1N1, or you could be H2N2, or H3N2. You could there'd be a different combination of things that will motivate different groups. And th that leads to behavior precision, behavioromics. And that is uh, the purpose of this type of experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.